Okay. Oh, wait. screen sharing. Stop screen sharing. Awesome. Awesome. All the people came back. Hi, everybody. <laughs> hey, everybody. Hi. We're hey, live. Welcome to Learning Space, everyone. Uh, I am your one of your hosts, Nicole Gallucci, postdoc with CosmoQuest Project. And my host, co-host through the wall, Georgia, who's back from vacation. Hey, back. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back. We missed you. Uh, so I have uh, enabled the question and answer app. So I see you guys in there. So hi. Yes, Michael, you got first comment. Uh, <laughs> hi, Guido. He's number one. one. He's like number f first post. Got to get in there. Man, that's been going on since the beginning of the internet. Um, <laughs> okay. So use the Q and A app if you're watching this. It should have a little join the conversation yellow thingy. I think it's over here, or maybe it's over here. It's somewhere on your screen. If you're watching this on YouTube or Google Plus or wherever it's embedded, uh, click the join the Q and A app. I disabled the applause app uh, in part because people said it sounded kind of annoying, uh, but also it's Akito said it was pr apparently pretty resource intensive and was kicking people out of the Q and A. So I've turned off the applause. Thanks for that, Google. Uh, and I've turned on the Showcase app. If you are trying to get to the Q&A and you see a link to Cool Cosmos instead, you're looking at the Showcase, you can toggle between the Showcase, where we share links, and the Q&A, where you can ask questions by clicking the thing that looks like a tiny Rubik's Cube. I think it's here. <laughs> I think it's here on your screen. Um, so that's all the, the um, Hangout business ends, so thanks for joining us. We are going to be talking about Cool Cosmos uh, with Carolyn Brinkworth and Tim Pyle, who joined us from Caltech. Well, thanks, you guys. Hey, welcome. Uh, sure. So you guys are at JPL, Caltech, Spit Science Center, IPAC, all the acronyms. Yeah. Uh, why don't you guys uh, go ahead and introduce yourselves all briefly uh, and, and uh, maybe tell us a little bit about your background and what got you into, um, into working with Spitzer. So, Carolyn, do you want to start? Sure, I can do, yeah. Um, so my name's Carolyn Brinkworth. Um, I started working at Spitzer as a postdoc about nine and a half years ago um, and then ended up joining the public affairs team here. And so I've now been working with the IPAC communications and education team for about five years, I think. Um, I was the deputy lead of the team until um, two days ago. <laughs> I just actually left IPAC. Um, I'm on my way to the National Center for Atmospheric Research, so I have a new job. Um, but uh, my background is was in astrophysics. Um, uh, that's my PhD is in astrophysics. But I also I'm just finishing my master's in education. Um, so awesome. I have the education component as well. In fact, you gave a really was that all you needed, or was yeah. there something else as well? No, that's in fact you gave a really great talk about the um, the master's work you're doing, which we highlighted a couple of weeks ago. Uh, here on the show, because we talked about uh, some of the cool stuff I saw at ASP, and one of the things I talked about was your talk. Uh, so I think that was really Very cool. cool. So thanks for that. Uh, Tim? Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Tim Pyle. Uh, I've been working at IPAC uh, for about 10 years, and uh, most of that time has been in what is, is now called the ICE, uh, ICE team, the ICE department, IPAC communications and education. Uh, prior to that, I, uh, I worked in Hollywood doing uh, animation and visual effects for like films. Uh, I worked for Nickelodeon uh, for, for a couple years. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, I was brought in because I had, um, I didn't, I didn't have a science training, a science trains background per se, but I had a very strong interest in science since I was a kid, especially astronomy. Uh, and I brought in uh, the production experience, uh, video production, animation, those kinds of things. Uh, so I generally do um, graphics for press releases, uh, still images, animations. I do that for the Spitzer Space Telescope, uh, the Kepler Space Telescope, uh, a number of others. And in between all of that work, I do a lot of production work on irrelevant astronomy. Cool. Um, so why don't you give us the background? What is Cool Cosmos? I've included the link on the Showcase app. Um, what is Cool Cosmos? What is it teaching? Can we take that one, Tim? Yes, um, so, um, sorry, Tim is in the same room as me. Just thinking yes. Over there. <laughs> um, so, Cool Cosmos is quite um, a big umbrella thing. It's it's. The Cool Cosmos itself is a website which is designed to talk about infrared light and to teach about 
how infrared light is used on Earth and how it's used uh, in space as well. And so it's everything from, you know, firefighters using it to look through smoke in burning buildings to find people, um, to police using it to, you know, chase people at night, um, to military uses, to archaeology. They, they used um, infrared light a lot in archaeology to look down and um, find hidden um, pathways that used to be used um, by ancient civilizations, so it's very cool. Um, but they also use it, um, you know, for example, to find marijuana crops. Um, apparently, they reflect infrared light differently to other crops, <laughs> so they can use that to find as well. Um, but then in space, we have a whole bunch of different things that we use it for there. And so, if you think of different types of light, um, there's different ways of looking at the universe. Um, so, if you're looking at the human body, for example, if you want to know if I have ribs, you need to take an X-ray of me. Um, but if you take an X-ray of me, you don't know the color of my shirt. And so, you then need to use both an X-ray and visible light to build up that picture of me. But then, if you want to know um, like the temperature of me, you can use infrared light. And so that gives you an extra piece of information. So if you use x-rays and visible light to see the color of my shirt and then uh, infrared to find out my temperature, then you can build up this big picture of me. And in the same way, we use um, infrared light in space, many, many different wavelengths in space, to build up you know, complete pictures of the universe. And so um, what Spitzer does primarily is um, it looks through dust to, to see star-forming regions because um, uh, you know, light, uh, visible light just hits the outside of the clouds <laughs> that we were looking at in star forming regions, whereas infrared light looks straight through. Um, and we can use it to find exoplanets, we can use it to look way, way back in the, you know, very, very early universe. And so Cool Cosmos brings all this together and it tells you all about the infrared missions and the infrared, you know, uses of infrared in space and on Earth. Now, Irrelevant Astronomy, which is what Tim is involved in, is um, a, a set of videos, which I'm going to let him talk about because he's the expert, um, but it's basically a video podcast um, that uh, has a whole bunch of different you know, Spitzer results. And so I will pass over to Tim and he can tell you all about Irrelevant Astronomy. Thanks. Um, one other comment about Cool Cosmos is, um, yes, it's in one sense it's saying that we think the cosmos is cool, uh, as in awesome. <laughs> Uh, but <laughs> back to that, um, infrared light is is basically um, emitted by anything that's. I'm, I'm probably going to totally butcher this, this definition, but <laughs> basically it's emitted from anything <laughs> that can emit heat. Even really really cool objects, um, they generate infrared light. So we are looking at objects that are really cool temperature wise in the universe. Did I do that okay? okay. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> I've added a link specifically to we, we've trained it well. <laughs> I've added a link specifically to the irrelevant astronomy videos in the showcase, so you can uh, reach that as well. So tell us. So I came across irrelevant astronomy probably because of one of the Felicia Day videos at some point. <laughs> right, so Nicole. Yeah, you've heard about this, but this was new to me. So yeah, I'm curious about the irrelevant astronomy videos. Can you tell us? Yeah, well, what makes it irrelevant? <laughs> <laughs> okay, what makes it irrelevant? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, it's we capitalize the I and the R in irrelevant because it's it's actually I R relevant astronomy, right. as in infrared relevant. <laughs> all the videos touch on. Infrared science, in particular, science that comes from the Spitzer Space Telescope, but also science in general that that infrared observatories like Spitzer um, uh, partake in. So, um, yeah, we originally started the series about six years ago, mm -hmm. and the idea was that we were looking at our outreach products, our education products, and we realized that there was a gap that we weren't really really filling, and that was uh, targeting uh, a general public that's somewhere between young children and the educated public like late high school into college. Mm -hmm. And so we looked to create a video series that would, um, that would reach them. And, in, and also as far as uh, the theme, you know, the, the style of the show, we were, kind of trying to, we were kind of doing an experiment with it in that we wanted to teach the science but we wanted to run comedy, so with the hopes that other people who weren't necessarily looking, you know, to learn science, might come across them, and they might actually, you know, be exposed to the science that we think is interesting, and and we think everybody should find interesting, and we would actually reach people then that we otherwise could not reach through our traditional products. 
Cool. Um, so uh, it's been. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say I always thought of uh, ir irrelevant might have uh, should have been irreverent astronomy as well. Cause it's, like, <laughs> it's it's more humorous, it's more fun. It's not just a professor lecturing at you. <laughs> yes. Well, sometimes um, when the press talks about us, they call all the. It's an easy mistake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a question. Totally change the name. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from Adam uh, Synergy. Uh, I know s both Spitzer and Herschel have run out of coolant, um, so they uh, don't have the coolant to do certain bands of infrared. Um, but Spitzer still has some functionality. Is Spitzer still going to keep going um, until JWST and is, is in orbit? Do, do you know what the lifetime of the Spitzer mission is? Good question. Um, yes, we have the capability to keep going until JWST launches. Um, obviously, that depends on funding, and yes. so it just depends on how long NASA keeps the funding flowing. Um, we were recently reapproved for another two years of funding, which is excellent. Excellent news. Um, we can keep going until JWST is launched, uh, which is due for 2018. There's going to be a point at which the telescope gets too far away that we can no longer talk to it. The, the bandwidth basically just gets too low. And I forget what the bandwidth is right now, but it is way, way less than you get on your cell phone. I mean, it's, it's something crazy like eight bits per second or something nuts mm -hmm. like that. You know, so we're, we're kind of you know easing down this data. It's like trying to tease it out of the spacecraft at the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we eventually are going to get too far away to be able to talk to Spitzer, which okay. will happen sometime around 2018, 2019, I think. Um, and there's also a point at which Spitzer can no longer point back towards the Earth because um, the way Spitzer works, it basically has right on the bottom of it, I don't think we have a picture in here, unfortunately, um, but right on the bottom of Spitzer, um, there's the high gain antenna. But at all times, you need to keep the sunshade between the telescope and the sun, obviously, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's why it's called the sunshade. Um, otherwise, you overheat the telescope. And so there's an angle problem, basically. You have to be able to turn the telescopes so that its butt points towards Earth, but you've also got to keep the sunshades between the telescope and the sun. And so there's just a point at which that geometry doesn't work anymore, and so we, we then can't talk to it. Um, but definitely the data rate is going to be, I believe, the limiting factor first. Um, and so there's, there'll be a point at which, as well, the data rate is so low that we can still you know, keep talking to Spitzer as long as it keeps running, but if it goes into what we call safe mode, if something goes a bit strange on the telescope and it, it kind of goes into safe mode to protect itself, we won't have the bandwidth to be able to wake it up. So basically, we all kind of sit here and cross our fingers every single day that Spitzer is going to keep working, and it's been an amazing telescope. You know, It's worked absolutely perfectly, way beyond spec. I mean, it was only supposed to last five years, and we're now in year 11. So it's an incredible piece of kit. It's, you know, I don't I don't want to say it's worked flawlessly because I'll then have to touch wood, but um, it has worked flawlessly, and uh, yeah, we, we have no expectation that anything is going to, you know, we, we decide to turn it off, you know, because JWST has gone up. So, yeah, cross fingers, everyone. Good job, Spitzer. Yeah. Good and job, and big, props, <laughs> big props, I was going to say, go to our, our software yeah. engineers um, who have actually found Absolutely. ways um, in recent years of increasing the efficiency of some of the in instruments. So even though um, only one instrument, I guess, is still operating at this point, it's operating better than it ever has before. So we're getting these th this incredible data from it that's really precise. Wow. It's just getting better. And better. Yeah, and it's not only that as well. They also um, they've managed to operate on much lower bandwidths. They've changed how the telescope operates. They've managed to change the angle at which we can get closer to the sun. I mean, they are geniuses <laughs> in the engineering department, both software engineering and you know, physical engineering. They've done amazing work. Very cool. Um, so, oh, first, I, I also wanted to point out a comment from Nancy Graziano, something that I, I uh, approve of. Is there's no such thing as irrelevant astronomy. So. Yay. <laughs> it was IR relevant. Um, so when you guys started when you guys started this this podcast or this video series, what was um uh what what did you decide to tackle first? Like what did you think the, the first thing you wanted your audience to see? Okay. <laughs> Irrelevant astronomy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when we first started it, it actually looked a lot different than it does now. Mm -hmm. And it really has evolved over time because it's been so experimental. So like our, our actually our very first episode was um, we repurposed uh, a presentation about infrared light and how things look different in visible and infrared light than, you know, how, how, how basically things look different looking at them in those two different ways. 
uh, and there really wasn't very much comedy in it at all. So it's, it's funny to actually go back and look at that first episode. We thought it was an important one to start with because it explained, really in a very broad sense, what infrared light can do for you, what the benefit is of, looking, of, of getting infrared light from something instead of just looking at invisible light. Um, but yeah, a after that, we started experimenting with comedy, bringing in more animation. There wasn't even any CG animation in the first one, and now we actually go to that a lot. Um, so yeah, <laughs> there you go. So that's what we tackled first, just a general overview of infrared science. Now we've evolved into, um, we're trying to tie them the episodes more to, uh, to STEM education. Um, looking at like next generation standards, mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've started working more with with teachers and trying to get a sense for for what tools they need in the classroom. Um, uh, we started about halfway through the series. We started um, reaching out to celebrities. Uh, we didn't do that for the first whatever dozen or so episodes we made, um, and it turns out that celebrities are actually very supportive of both NASA and education, science education. So. You know, we were actually very pleasantly surprised at the response we got. So, yes. So originally we had basically a first episode that was more or less a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> and now we've evolved into these <laughs> big multimedia celebrity-laden productions. Yeah, so has it gotten more complex as far as, you know, actually writing a script for, for these? And, you know, as the whole series has evolved, it sounds like it's becoming bigger and bigger. Yes, and um, a sign of that is the fact that there's a lot more time in between the release of any given episodes. Mm -hmm. Because, yes, we, um, uh, it takes longer to write the scripts on a couple of different levels. One of them is, you know, just the story, the comedy. Like, I, I, I think I've been evolving <laughs> as a writer in, from that perspective. But the other way that's become more complex is because we're tying them into, again, education and STEM science and these, these science standards. And so we've, we've really been vetting them with a lot more people. I mean, it originally would just be like a couple of us in our group would go through them. We'd open it up into the larger group. Now we're reaching out to people outside our group. Um, yes. So, <laughs> yeah, long answer. It takes a lot longer to write a script. Yeah. Well, it's, it is. I'm not sure it takes that much longer to write the science in the script, but I think there's a lot, you know, there's definitely a lot with um, making sure that the science does tie into what teachers are telling students in classrooms. You know, there are some nuances in the ways that we as scientists would put things, and yet it doesn't make sense to use those words because those are not the words that teachers use. And so a lot of the time it is just trying to tailor everything to, you know, words that teachers would use in classrooms and making sure it makes sense for them to be able to use them. Yes, and also um, we've become aware that <coughs> Excuse me. Our our audience has grown uh, recently, and we've been more aware of the fact that something makes total sense to us and makes sense to everybody we've talked to, but we still really, really, and really you know, under a really big microscope to say, is there any way that anybody could misconstrue this to mean something else? Yeah. So, our, I mean, from basically in the past we might have. You know, two revisions of a script and we'll be done. Now it's not uncommon to have at least half a dozen, I mean, yeah. major revisions of the script until we feel like, okay, we have completely hashed the science. We are confident there are no, you know, no possibilities somebody could uh, mistake what we're trying to say. Kind of a little bit like you know, the Hippocratic Oath, you know, first do no harm, and as long as we're not doing any harm. First, <laughs> don't get the science wrong. <laughs> not even get it right, just don't get it wrong. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Are you working with any um, group of teachers sort of almost on a regular basis as you develop these videos? Do you have some people, some teachers that you kind of go to and have become regular sort of advisors on this, or it, does it just kind of depend on on the topic and who's available and all that? It depends. It quite often depends on who's available, to be honest. Not necessarily the topic, but we have a group of teachers. We try not to overload any one particular set of teachers, just because we're not able to pay them a stipend. And so, you know, we feel it's unfair to you know continually ask one group of people um, to help us out. And so. Um, one group we do work with a lot is our NITARP teachers, that's the NASA IPAC Teacher Archive Research Program. Um, and these are teachers who come and work with us for a year, and so they work from the home institutions, they're still teaching at the same time, but they work with scientists here at Spitzer, or IPAC actually, 
to do um, a genuine astronomy research project. And by genuine, I really mean that. You know, we have, let me just say that, working with this, we have scientists here who um, have a particular project that they're trying to work on. Mm -hmm. And uh, they work with, uh, we pair them with, with them, a teams of five teachers. And those five teachers then, you know, work with the scientists throughout the year. It's over, over a two-year period to do a, a full, you know, full-scale research project with them and their students. Um, and so we have this great group of alumni teachers through NITARP who love working with us. We love working with them, you know, and we're able to ask them for help and yeah. they're more than willing to, to, to give in. So they're mostly the people we tap for help if we can. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And I suppose there's probably information on your website, right, if teachers are interested in that program? And yes, please, please mm -hmm. apply. Um, well, I think, I believe the applications are closed for this year, um, but, you know, we have an application call go out with a deadline of September every year. Um, and so, yeah, please, please, if you know teachers who would like to, you know, do research That's with great. us, we would yeah. love to have them apply. Yeah. Okay. I can add that link in the showcase as well, so you guys can check out the night. I believe it's nightarp.ipac.caltech.edu. Yep, that's the one. <laughs> so I'll add that to the showcase for you guys Sweet. as well. Um, so, what is your, what is one of your favorite ways of getting across um, what infrared telescopes do? Do you have a favorite analogy or a favorite um, story or, or character that you've used? <laughs> I don't know. I think it depends on the media. I mean, I go out and do a lot of talks with kids, and so I, I use the, you know, do I have ribs analogy. And so, yeah. I, again, in the same way that I talked to you earlier about, you know, using different types of light, I basically say to the kids, do I have ribs? And they're like, yeah, of course you have ribs. I said, well, how can you prove it? <laughs> and it's just asking them to think of all the ways, and, you know, so I, I get them to talk about x-rays and, you know, punching me in the, in, in the side and cutting me open and all this kind of thing. So we talk about all those different ways. Um, but we also talk a lot about, you know, infrared light being able to see through dust and, yeah, just, yeah, different ways of looking at the, at the universe. I don't know that I have a particular great analogy for it, but um, yeah, quite often we just, you know, talk about different types of light. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's kind of evolved as well over time. Like, uh, when I first started here, uh, I'm basically a layman. So I, I was, I'm an animator, and I, I, I wasn't trained to be a scientist. So I came in, and I was basically like, okay, so tell me what's infrared light. And one of the first ways it was explained to me is that infrared light is basically heat. Now, this was a, a, an explanation that we used early on. And so that I thought, okay, it kind of helped me wrap my brain around the idea that you may not be able to see something, but if it's got any bit of warmth to it, it will emit infrared light. Now, the thing is, recently we've, recently, I guess in the last few years or so, we've sort of gone back and reevaluated that, and we've, we've realized that that could actually be a little bit misleading. Yeah. So we had to change, we had to kind of change a more complex answer of the fact that infrared light is, is emitted by things that can emit heat, even if it's just a tiny amount of heat and it's really cold. Like it became a very long, long <laughs> answer. And so we're, we're still actually in the process of trying to come up with a new short, concise analogy. Yeah. Not quite there yet. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard. Yeah, it's really hard. <laughs> infrared lights, infrared light. What do you guys, what do you mean? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and I think the more accurate you want to be, the, the longer and more complex the explanation has to get. So, yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Exactly. You know, that's the most everything we do. Is, you know, how, how much how we... You sound like a dollar. Yeah, I don't want to do it down. <laughs> I yeah, sound you, the sound's coming through, funny. You sound a bit like a Dalek. Uh, <laughs> Is that any better? No. I don't know how to fix that. A little bit Dalek-y. Am I, I Dalek-y as well? No, not yet. Okay, you oh. <laughs> You're in the same room. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Try again. Okay, <laughs> let me know if this really isn't working. I was saying that uh, it's always a, a huge um, issue for us in, in, you know, balancing the difference between, you know, do we get the science absolutely correct, or yeah. do we say it in a way that people can actually understand it without a physics degree, you know? And this is always a very delicate balance for us. It's, it's difficult to know sometimes where that line needs to be drawn. And, you know, I think we're getting better at it. I think we are definitely, you know, becoming much more experienced in figuring out where that has to be, but, uh, yeah. Do you have to have a new crop? I feel like I have to have a new a new newbie to astronomy. Like, I've used up my partner. I can't use him anymore. I can't run astronomy things by him because he knows the jargon now. 
I've been doing it for five years. Like, what did you have? Do you like test it on a new crop of people, um, or do you do anything like that? You know, we we don't. We probably should. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. I don't know. It's I, not easy to get people. They used to test. You need fresh people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they used to test it on me when I first started. Right. Yeah. But at this point, after ten long. years, I'm pretty yeah. much not really a newbie <laughs> myself. So I will sometimes test it on my wife. Uh huh. But I think my wife is now reaching the point where she's yeah. pretty familiar <laughs> with it, and she's not really a newbie either. So. Yeah, maybe yeah. my wife's sisters or something. <laughs> we can start expanding. Yeah, I tested out my girlfriend for a while before I went to a party with my girlfriend. And she based, somebody asked her what it was I did, and she just explained perfectly, completely, using all the right words. I'm like, well, well <laughs> all right then. It's my job, all right. <laughs> exactly, I'll just, I'll just sit in the corner, you can go ahead. <laughs> That's fantastic. I'm doing the work for you. <laughs> not a bad problem to have, yeah. Oh, um, we have a, another science question. Uh, how does Spitzer Telescope aid in the search for exoplanets? Or maybe you could talk about Spitzer or infrared in general. Yeah, so um, infrared astronomy is really useful. The, the problem in looking for exoplanets is that you have something that's very, very faint. If you're th talking about visible light. So you have something that's very, very faint next to something that's very, very bright. Because the planets only reflect light. They don't have their own light. Whereas the star that they're going around is very, very bright. And so it's basically trying to find, you know, a, a, um, a little glow bug next to a lighthouse, you know. <laughs> it's virtually impossible to see. Um, the great thing about infrared light is that you're looking in a different part of the spectrum. And you're looking at a part of the spectrum where the light from the star, because the stars are very, very hot, once you move out to the infrared, then the stars look dimmer than they do in visible light. And it's all to do with the... Um, the, the spectrum of the light that's coming out. So the spectrum of a light in a star peaks somewhere in the ultraviolet uh, and in the visible light. And by the time you move out to infrared wavelengths, um, you have much less light coming from the star at those wavelengths. Mm -hmm. The planet is just the opposite because planets are much, much cooler. Their light output peaks in the infrared. So they're very faint in the ultraviolet, in fact, more or less you know, invisible in the ultraviolet. But by the time you get out to infrared wavelengths on the electromagnetic spectrum, they're much brighter. And so you go from this you know, very, very bright star and very, very dim planet and kind of move them together. Now, star is always going to be brighter, <laughs> um, but just that extra little bit of brightness or difference in contrast that you get in the infrared makes it much, much easier to see the planets. And it's still difficult, don't get me wrong. I mean, the, the, the changes we're, we're looking at are I mean, these are maybe you know one or two photons from <laughs> from the planet next to you know several hundred thousands of photons uh, from the uh, from the star, but um, it is much easier to see exoplanets uh, in infrared. Yeah, when we were before the first yeah before the first exoplanets were imaged, um, we were all predicting it would come from an infrared telescope, and I think it ended up being ground-based infrared telescopes that were the first to get an actual picture of or actual photons reflected from uh, an exoplanet for that reason. Oh. I have to take a word for that, actually. Yeah. I think I'm pretty sure it is. I think it is. Yeah. Um, also, uh, oh, we have a, a, a suggestion from Nancy Graziano. If you can get the stars of the Big Bang Theory on irrelevant <laughs> astronomy, <laughs> I, I know they charge like a million per episode for the show. So you know, if they're willing to donate their time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that. Um... I, I'm a big fan of that show, and and the fact that it takes place at Caltech, it's it kind of seems like a no-brainer, and <laughs> they are so definitely on my on my wish list. Yes. Awesome. So <laughs> we're just we've got a big wish list, and we're just <laughs> we're working through it. <laughs> but yes, I would love to get them in. So you guys have had. If they were uh, I'm people I'm huge fans of, like Will Wheaton and Veronica Belmont, and of course George Decay. <laughs> How do you get these people? <laughs> <laughs> to talk about science, <laughs> you know, they, they probably have. I mean, they're probably bombarded with all kinds of requests. Yeah, I I imagine that they are, and how we get them, you know, I think I know about as much as you do. I think that we're incredibly lucky. I think that we, I mean, we find these people cool as well, mm -hmm. and so we reach out to them and we ask them. You know, um, we these people all have agents, publicists. Um, so we'll talk to them, tell them what we're doing, give them a proposal, a script, and say, would you please consider doing it, even though we can't really pay you anything. Um, and a lot of people, like you've mentioned, um, 
like Will, George, uh, Veronica, they tend to be very interested uh, in science, mm -hmm. and that's generally why why they come over and do it. It's not it's not about the money for them. They're interested in science. They're interested in in fostering science education. Um, uh, like Cameron Diaz was one that we had, and and she it was was very much the reason we got her was because she was really she liked NASA and she was really interested in education. That's cool. So she very generously donated her, what I'm sure is very expensive time to come in and and do our do one of our episodes. Mm -hmm. So that's really it. It's nothing that we're doing on our side other than simply asking them. It's mm -hmm. totally the celebrities wanting to do it. Oh. And it helps when you pick up the phone and say, "Hey, this is NASA calling. We'd like you to be in one of our videos." <laughs> Nothing. Well. Like that. The NASA <laughs> name definitely helps. The NASA right, does they've help. Been they've been incredibly generous. It's, uh, we've been yeah. a bit blown away, actually. Cool, cool. Have um have they uh, contributed? When you have people come in, do they contribute to the script? Um, do they suggest changes as you go, or are you like, oh god, no, we already spent like about eighteen months on this? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think anybody's ever come in and suggested changes to the science part of the script, and for the most part, nobody really even suggest changes to the scripts at all. Mm -hmm. But what they will do is they'll come in and and they'll have some ideas about how to play the character or maybe they'll want to try a, a couple of different takes. Mm -hmm. We always do that and almost always whenever somebody suggests something about how they want to do it, it usually comes out really well. <laughs> so of course we're always willing to, to let them do that because they have great instincts about you know how the character would sound, how they should sound as the character. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Awesome. Um, what inspired some of these these uh, animated characters that that you have in the series, like the uh, astronomy anemone? <laughs> <laughs> Where did you come up with that? That's awesome. <laughs> um, uh, different places. <laughs> Astron Is there alcohol astronomy. Astronomy. Be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a bit. Um, astronomy anemone. <laughs> <laughs> it really came it came out of the fact that I just thought astronomy and anemones sounded awesome together. So let's make an astronomy anemone. <laughs> and then it was just, okay, how can that be really funny? Well, what if it's really giant and it eats its co-host at the end? Boom. Episode. <laughs> <laughs> so. Sorry, Veronica, but that is really funny. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say that to, to our meetings, um, you know, to, to kind of give, you know, pitch this stuff, and we're sitting there going like, wait, what? <laughs> you want to do <laughs> <Yes>. what? <laughs> and, and honestly, I am terrible at pitching these ideas. I mean, <laughs> they, usually, they usually hit like a lead balloon because I'm just so awful. And it's not until I, I write up like, <laughs> there she is. Veronica did an awesome job in that episode. <laughs> it's usually not until I actually write it out that, that you know, <laughs> it starts to gel and I actually find the character's voice a little bit more and, and everybody understands we'll get on the same page and we move forward. And there have been situations where I've pitched something that's just been so horribly bizarre that we actually have decided, let's set that aside. <laughs> okay, I would love to hear at least one of these ideas that's been set aside. Well, maybe offline. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> if you're not willing to share, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. uh, what about the the musical episode? You had at least one musical episode, if if not more. Um, what uh, was yeah. that? A lot of production. Is there a lot more production that goes into a uh, bit of the musical? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yes. yes and no. It depends on uh, whose perspective you're talking about. Uh, from our perspective, um, probably a little bit less. In that we came up with we come up with the science we come up with talking points, but we then in, in both of the musicals we've done so far we both we handed both of them off to a very talented uh, songwriter, uh, wow. and he basically created the uh, the lyrics, which were essentially you know three fourths of the episode. So in that sense, it became a lot easier. Um, yeah, but I mean the production was. Pretty pretty much took about the same amount of time, okay. you know, same amount of animation, video, filming. Gotcha, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Um, so the 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 most recent one, astronomy and Emily on the page. Are there any um, more recent than that one? Because we have uh, a question. Oh. Uh, Guido asking about that. 
Oh, yes. In okay. fact, uh, I think you're probably looking at an old page. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, it's, the, it's the Cool Cosmos links, Tim, and so we've not updated the Cool Cosmos links. So, yes, if you uh, go okay. to um, the Spitzer page, yes. uh, spitzer.caltech.edu. Slash irrelevant. Yeah. Okay. Actually, like slash video audio slash irrelevant. Well, no, if you just type spitzer.caltech.edu oh, really? slash irrelevant, it should take you right there. Irrelevant. Okay. We're trying that. <laughs> I'll share I'm that. Like, that. <laughs> <laughs> it's spinning. It's spinning. Okay, because I shared the link from Cool Cosmos, um, but these are all up on YouTube as well. Is it all on on the Spitzer channel? It is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, NASA Spitzer, I think. Okay. Um, what uh, what scripts are you working on currently that you may be allowed to talk about? <laughs> um, I I don't. No, if we should talk about them yet, we've got a couple that are actually in post, various degrees of post production. We'll probably talk about the subjects. We've got one on yes. um, Spitzer engineering, which I think is pretty cool, talking about how Spitzer got re-engineered um, in order to make it uh, more sensitive and, and better at picking up exoplanets. So uh, that's one of them. So we, I think one of the subjects we've got, got going on that actually talks about. Um, uh, uh, Astropix, thank Astro you. Astropix, we've got one Astropix. Astropix. Okay. Yeah. Astropix being, yeah. okay. Do you want to talk about what, I, I mentioned it really briefly in a previous episode, but if you want to talk about what Astropix is, tell people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you were at that talk, too, I saw you. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go on. Um, Astropix is basically it's, uh, it's an archive or a database um, of astronomical imagery and so um, it pulls together all the astronomical images from um, m uh, pretty much all of NASA's telescopes I believe now um, or, or many of the, uh, the, the astrophysics telescopes and so it's the Hubble Space Telescope, Spitzer, um, Chandra, Wise, Herschel, New Star I believe is in there um, and then we have um, the European Southern Observatory who have also joined in um, and so the idea is, is it's a one-stop shop for people who are looking for astronomical imagery. Um, so you can find that at astropix.ipac.caltech.edu. Um, just double check that for me, Tim. <laughs> um, and it's fully searchable. Um, the really novel thing about Astropix is that the metadata, so all the things about the image are embedded in the image and so yeah. um, one of the problems that we've found in the past is when you go and do a Google search of the Eagle Nebula, for example, um, you have you know 12 dozen pictures of the Eagle Nebula, um, but not all of them have a caption attached to them, for example. And so you get all these you know pictures in different sizes and different shapes, but you don't necessarily have any information about what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And Astropix preserves all the information by embedding it into the images, um, into the headers of the images. So when you pull it up, you can access that information very easily. And so it's not just the caption; it's also links to press releases. It's links to um, the orientation on the sky, the coordinates, the uh, distance that it is from Earth, um, you know, which constellation it's in. And so the really cool thing is from Astropix, you can click on the View in Worldwide Telescope button, <laughs> um, and it will basically grab that image and take it to Worldwide Telescope and drop it straight in the right part of the sky. And you can then look at all the different wavelengths um, of, of images that were taken in that part of the sky. So it's a very, very cool, uh, cool uh, archive, and we're very proud of it. So we're we're in beta right now. We're almost ready to make it, you know, live to the world. But you can go and check it out now, and, and let us know what you think. We very much value feedback. We really want to know how people are using it and um, problems you find with it. Um, yeah. So. Okay. So I've, I'm adding that link to the showcase. I also found, um, so if you go to the main Spitzer page and click video and audio, that's where the updated uh, 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 videos are. And and I, I doing that, I was reminded of the, where did you come up with the idea for a brain parasite with Alan Tudyk's voice? <laughs> uh, where did I come up with that? I have no idea. <laughs> but I, I just want to say, <laughs> Alan Tudyk was awesome. I mean, that, uh, basically, everybody who's come yeah, in has I've given us I've heard he's like an over-caffeinated squirrel, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but just to, give, just to give Alan a quick, a, a great shout-out, um, Alan was the first time... I mean, everybody's given great performances, you know, a little bit of a twing, a little differently. Uh, Alan basically sat down 
and just went through the scripts and did it perfectly from start to finish. Oh my god! To the point that it, I, my thought was just like, I can't imagine this being delivered any other way. Like yeah. he just nailed it. it. Was good. It and was then for good. safety, we. It was awesome, and for safety, we decided to have him, yeah, obviously, go back through and read him one more time, and it was just as awesome. And then I was like, well, now I don't know which take to take because they're both perfect. <laughs> Alan, he's just, he's a brilliant voice actor, and we were so lucky and so impressed by what he did for us. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Alan uh, And Will, of course, has always been... Uh, oh, yeah. For those of you who don't know, uh, Alan Dudek played Wash and Firefly, um best known for. Uh, also had an amazing character in Dollhouse. Um, I know he's done a bunch of other things, but I'm pretty limited on my, <laughs> on my, my yeah, big well, media. He, he's been doing a lot, of, uh, a lot of voices for animated features, so he played like mm -hmm. King Candy in Wreck-It Ralph, and he played the Duke of Wessel Wesselton in uh, Frozen. Hmm. Okay. So, so yeah, he's, he's building a, a great seen. career. Awesome. Oh. oh. It's a great movie. My daughter is in love with that movie. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm so behind. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, oh yeah, but as far as Brain Parasite, I just wanted to make that one other comment that um, Will Will Wheaton has done uh, like several several videos for us, and he's always been very generous. Has always, you know, basically left the door open, saying, you know, whenever you need anything, he's he's supportive not just of us, but but of all of NASA and if you read his you know Twitter feed or anything, of just science education in general. Mm -hmm. So you know we were really really fortunate to be able to to meet him and 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 build up a relationship with him, and he was <laughs> very generous to come in and play that part of a guy whose brain is shut off because he has a brain parasite. <laughs> so great. Fun. <laughs> like, you made me want to have a brain parasite with Alan Tudyk's voice. I don't think that was <laughs> Not the exact point, but that's an awesome sub-point. <laughs> I was like, how did I not share this? This is fantastic. Um, and so what was your last one? Was fusion versus fission? Do you want to tell us a little bit about, um, about your computer technicians dealing with the uh, runaway AI there? Yeah, that one. Um, so the AI is, is from the, the video game series Portal, mm -hmm. which I'm a huge fan of. Um, and uh, so uh, she came in. We actually talked with Valve just to make sure that it was cool that we were doing this, you know, spoofing, spoofing GLaDOS. So the story is that GLaDOS gets installed at NASA. And, and the character from the video games is very um, pro-science to the point of like, she doesn't mind if she kills off every human on the planet if it means she's advancing her own scientific knowledge. So she's a little bit mad, science mad in that case. Um, so she came in and she wants to take over, over the world and she's installed and the only thing stopping her from being hooked up and gaining access to all of NASA's science are these two hapless computer techs who are, are a little suspicious that she might be evil, and so she has to prove that she is not. <laughs> um, so yeah, that that episode ended up being our our uh, most viewed uh, video on YouTube of of all the videos we've released from Spitzer, just because everybody like CNET, uh, uh, the Mary Sue Wired, like everybody covered it and linked to us. Uh, we just got a phenomenal uh, outpouring of support for that episode. Very cool, very cool. So those of you guys watching, keep sharing it out. Uh, I think you have a couple of volunteers in the comment, in the Q&A app, who want to be in your videos. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to probably live in California and know something about acting. Uh, not that you guys don't. I know uh, Tommy yeah. <laughs> in uh, Finland or, or Sweden, so yeah. <laughs> probably have to be local for those guys. Uh, yeah, close so to Pasadena really cool. would be helpful. <laughs> close to Pasadena would help. Yeah. Um, have there been any, uh, maybe, do you have a, a favorite moment from production or something that was uh, particularly difficult to overcome in, in production of these videos along the way? Um, well, if there was something difficult to overcome, I hesitate to bring that up because I want everyone to think I'm a production genius <laughs> and nothing ever goes wrong. <laughs> So, I'm a production genius. Nothing ever goes wrong. <laughs> but if it did, and it, <laughs> and if something pretty much happened every episode, um, we just get through it. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, the, the one thing that I've learned from doing these videos is that no matter how much you, you prepare and plan, whatever you're not expecting to go wrong will be the thing that goes wrong. Of course. And so it'll always be something. Um, yeah, I, yeah. So, <laughs> but we work with a, a great group of people who, um, a very talented people, uh, production team, who uh, with our joint knowledge, everybody steps up whenever there's an issue and we just get through it. Awesome. Yeah. Um, as far as just like great moments, uh, there are so many of them. Um, I, but one of them I will call out is our first video with a celebrity. Um, uh, was a video with Sean Astin, mm -hmm. and honestly, I think you know we we talked to him, we talked to his agent, uh, we pitched him the script. He said yes, he would love to do it. And in fact, he told us that pretty much as soon as he heard it was NASA, he said yes, I'm on board. I want to do this. It's educational. <laughs> it's NASA. Yeah, which was was very awesome. Uh, but I think there was still a part of me who was thinking, you know, this is not going to happen. <laughs> And and it was that moment when you know Sean Aston turned the corner and walked into the room on the set, and it was just like wow, okay, it's kind of that surreal moment of yeah. Sean Aston is here. It's Sean Aston. <laughs> it was very awesome. And Sean ended up doing uh, several episodes mm -hmm. for us. He's always been um, a, a great friend to us in what we're doing. And whenever we've asked him, he said yes. So big shout out and a thanks to Sean for doing that and for creating one of the most awesome moments for me. <laughs> If you had to, um, what, would, what would be, uh, I think, the most important message to take away from your work with, with Cool Cosmos and Irrelevant Astronomy from, from each of you? Either oh, you to take take that first or educators <laughs> or, yeah, or to the public at large. I guess, I mean, I think the most important thing th to take away from me is that NASA is still doing amazing things, you know, I, I, the, the space flight program with the shuttle may have ended, but there is such cool science happening right now from NASA. I mean, we do really, really cool stuff, and it was actually incredibly difficult for me to decide to leave and go and get another job, because I'm like, I work for NASA right now doing really cool science, you know, yeah. how is it possible I can walk away from this? And it's just... It, I think NASA, you know, even, even the name, even though it's been a long time since, you know, the glory days of the Apollo missions and this kind of thing, still has this ability to really, you know, get in me and make me excited. And I think it does for everybody. I mean, there was a, a moment when Curiosity landed on Mars and, mm -hmm. you know, somebody was in Times Square and hearing the public, as, as they were watching, you know, Curiosity land on Mars on the huge, you know, Jumbotron in Times Square, hearing the public, you know, chant NASA, NASA, NASA. <laughs> and someone said, you know, when was the last time you heard the public chanting the name of a, um, you know, a government agency, you know, <laughs> in a positive way? When does this ever happen? <laughs> And so I think NASA has this amazing ability to inspire, you know, future generations in, 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 into science. And, and, you know, NASA, you've got to remember, NASA belongs to all of us because we're all taxpayers. Even I'm a taxpayer, even though I don't sound like I'm from here. Um, but, you know, we're all U.S. taxpayers. And NASA belongs to all of us. It's our legacy. It's our heritage uh, for everybody in the country, you know, not just the people who work here and not just, you know, the, the people who, you know, grew up with it. And so it, it, it's really an incredible organization. And um, we're doing amazing, amazing work. And I, I love the fact that, you know, Irrelevant Astronomy and Cool Cosmos help to promote the work work that we do beyond human spaceflight, but all the science that we do, because mm -hmm. it's incredibly cool stuff. And, you know, I just wish that, um, you know, I wish we could get more money to, to do even <laughs> more cool science. Yeah. And I can say this now, because I don't work for NASA. So <laughs> um, but, you yeah, can't say that really, now. Look at I you. can't say that now, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I would love it if we could just, you know, fund it, and because and, we do such cool stuff. And I think we do such cool stuff for, you know, the very sh small budgets that we have. And oh, yeah. it's, it's just neat. You know, so yeah, yeah. more science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that um, one of the things that, that some people don't don't realize is the fact that that an important part of NASA isn't just learning all these things about the universe and the cosmos, but it's also conveying that to the public. Education has always been really important to NASA and a big part of it. And that's why we do sites like Cool Cosmos or video series like Irrelevant Astronomy or there's there's a lot of other great video series both from from us, from Caltech, JPL, and also all the other missions, like Chandra, Hubble, and you know every, everybody. There's a lot of uh, great material that's that's being put out for the sole purpose of letting the public understand what we've learned, why it's why we think it's so important, and where we can go from here. Um, 
and uh, and and Carolyn was talking um, a little bit about Astropix, and and that's another great example of we've basically had all, a lot of these images all over the place, like like Spitzer, uh, Spitzer Space Telescope puts their images on the Spitzer website. Uh, Chandra puts them on theirs. Hubble puts them on their sites. You know, there's so many telescopes out there that we realized it was a, it was a little bit disjointed, and sometimes it was a little difficult to find all of NASA's product. Yeah. So that's why we came up with this idea of creating this one-stop shop, basically, to get all of NASA's image images, to have all the metadata tags, so it's easy to understand, um, and uh, something that people don't not every but understands is is that not only are we just putting them out there for people to look at and say, oh, that's a really pretty picture, or okay, I get that you learned something, but these are basically free for people to use, like all of NASA's images. Like people have taken NASA uh, artist concepts, uh, telescope images, anything we produce, and they've used them like in billboard advertisements or commercials, or used them on uh, TV shows and movies. And I think that's that's so great, you know, that 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 we're 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 producing this content and people are actually uh, making use of it. Um, so that that really excites me. Um, so irrelevant is proud to be doing this, and um, uh, I'll just leave it with this. Like one of the, uh, the our last episodes, fusion versus fission. Again, we got a lot of people looking at this, and probably 80, 90 percent of the comments online on YouTube or other sites were along the lines of, you know. Wow, NASA, you tricked me into learning something, and that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's shocking for YouTube yeah. comments, which are usually wild. <laughs> well, it, yeah, it's amazing that, um, yeah, like fusion versus fission is just like, what is it, like 5,000, 6,000 thumbs ups and like mm. double digit thumbs downs, which is like this insane ratio, which, <laughs> you know, it's just, yeah. we never see on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, I'm just checking the comments on the event page. Uh, Wikipedia has an episode guide to irrelevant astronomy as well. So oh, yes. You, Look at that. you guys are all comprehensive on Wikipedia. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that probably helps a lot. Um, I was going to say, oh, when you said about these images show up in media, I remember this like specific point in Star Trek Voyager when all of a sudden the, the ship was covered in Hubble images. Like <laughs> everywhere they were, it was like a Hubble image. It was just like that moment in time when you saw that happen. And I totally think you should get Jerry Ryan if you haven't already had her. I don't I think there's been a Jerry Ooh, Ryan. You should get Jerry Ryan. <laughs> Jerry Ryan liked yeah. Cosmo Quest once upon a time, so I know she's all about the space. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? Um, uh, I I hope I don't get in trouble with anyone for saying this, but we actually did approach Jerry Ryan because yes, I'm a big fan of Jerry Ryan's, and at the time, it, it's uh, she was very busy, so yeah, she that, wasn't that able to sense. do that particular video. So uh, she's yeah. yeah I I mean I'd like to cycle back and <laughs> and contact her again. Try again, try again. Uh, I know that she is. I know she's very pro science. Um, I know that from like from her Twitter feed, uh, things that she's posted. Yeah. Yeah, but it it didn't work out at that particular time, but hopefully in the future. I feel like the, I mean there's just there's just a Voyager spoof waiting to happen. You know. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, um, a lot of people who work here are very big fans of Star Trek, and uh, when we created a new conference room uh, about a year or two, we we called it Astrometrics. Um, <laughs> because it actually had a large screen that we were able to throw data up onto, and it, it just felt very Star Trek Voyager-y. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you should come visit Nicole. I will show you. <laughs> show you metrics. <laughs> that sounds like fun. Oh, man. Um, I think that's it uh, that we have for questions. I want to thank you guys for coming on the show and 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 doing all of this and talking about this. Cool Cosmos is awesome. I can't tell you how fascinated I am by, I mean, I'm fascinated by infrared astronomy, but all the ways in which infrared's used on Earth. Um, check out that part of the site particularly, too, because it yeah, is Yeah, really I was going to cool. say, there's all kinds of other cool things on the Cool Cosmos site for teachers, yeah. right, and, you know, yeah. beyond the irrelevant astronomy videos, but, you know, more traditional videos, and Ask an Astronomer, I was just kind of perusing earlier today, and great stuff for teachers up there, so check that out. Yep, awesome, awesome. Yeah. Um, yes. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you thank for joining you. us, thank you. Carolyn. Um, <laughs> thank you for joining us, everybody watching and commenting and leaving us. Uh, I, we've we've had let's see, Thomas, Thomas Trenacher, 
uh, wants to move out there and help you and be a power engineer. <laughs> <laughs> and Nancy Graziano is a technical writer. She's in Jer she's on the other coast. She's in Jersey, but she's like she's. <laughs> So, she can fly out there. Yeah. Everybody just wants to kind of jump in and, and help. <laughs> it's the work you guys cool, do. Cool, that's awesome. <laughs> um, so thank you guys for watching. Um, our next broadcast is next Wednesday for Learning Space. Uh, same, I think it's same time, same place. Um, <clears throat> let me pull up the schedule. Uh, if you guys have any suggestions, we are currently filling our fall schedule with guests. So if you have a topic in mind or... Um, a person you'd like to, us to contact, uh, or if you have a project that you'd like to talk about on, on the show, uh, email us at educate at cosmoquest.org and let us know, and we will uh, see about getting that on the show. Next week, we will be um, rescheduling from way back a few months ago, Dark Skies Alcava, uh, the Dark Skies site, um, in protected Dark Skies site in Portugal. Uh, Apollonia had major internet fail last time we tried to do it, so we've rescheduled her, particularly because a bunch of people commented saying, I really, really, really wanted to see her um, and, and hear about that that particular uh, dark sky reserve. So we'll be doing that next week. Uh, Astronomy Cast is back on Mondays. Fraser and Pamela are recording episodes of Astronomy Cast. Afterwards, they do an open Q&A session, so you can get all your astronomy questions answered. Weekly Space Hangout is back on Fridays. Uh, you get a whole bunch of us talking about the space news from the week. Um, and after that, Morgan Renberg goes into the space community on Google Plus and will answer your questions and does a, a Q&A there. Um, and I think that's all the major shows that are going on. Virtual Star Parties on a monthly basis. Mm. Um, Google Lunar X Prize Hangouts are typically every two weeks, so you can check Pamela Gay's page for that. And I just realized I still have food dye on my fingers from class this morning. So, <laughs> hooray. <laughs> we're doing fun things. <laughs> we're just making a mess is what we were doing. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys again so much for, for joining us. And thanks for watching this week's Learning Space. Thanks, Nicole, Georgia. Thanks, Nicole. All right. Bye.